Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Java Fitzel, and welcome everyone to our exploit generation and JavaScript analysis automation with uh, WinDebug. A few words about ourselves. I have way too much information about myself on, uh, on Google or on the internet, so if you want to know anything about me, just Google up my name, and you will probably know my entire life. Um, back to school. Uh, I have a wife and a three-year-old son, and I love hiking as my number one uh, hobby, and of course the second one is security. And I have plenty of certification. For some reason, I just love to do them. I have plenty of unimportant ones and a few more useful ones, like the ones from offensive security. Hey, hello, folks. So my name is Miklos Debord. And um, as opposed to what Chaba was saying, I'm the dark person, so I don't have too much information published on my, about myself on the net. So I challenge you to find anything about me. Um, probably you'll find something from, from this week, but uh, not, not too much before that. So um, that said, um, I'm also married. I have uh, two beautiful kids. And uh, I'm also a hobbyist hacker. But uh, aside from you know, spending hours before the screen, I also do a lot of uh, hiking. And uh, each year, I try to do a bit of uh, you know, a challenge um, to try a new sport. So I have a less, lot less certificates than Chaba has, because he's an absolute champion at that. Uh, but the one that's probably relevant for today is, uh, is a JIAC RAM, so um, JIAC's reverse engineering model. So with that, back to Chaba. Thank you. Uh, so my, the first part is the automated exploit generation. Um, so the, what started the entire idea of it, um, making exploits, it kind of can be, or actually it is a really heavily manual process uh, when you start it. Um, because basically when you load the application, and crash it for the first time, you need to go around, discover the memory layout, check the registers, what which of them points to where, uh, and so on. Calculate offsets, calculate your space uh, on the buffer, and so on and so on. Uh, not speaking about when you load um, the application debugger and you start to develop your exploit, and maybe you forget to set your breakpoint and the application just crashes. Oh, I forgot it. Okay, let's start it over. Uh, you start the debugger, you attach the process, you crash it again, you forgot to set the breakpoint again, then you maybe make a mistake with uh, your shell code or with the memory address. By mistake, you make the memory address in big endian instead of little endian, and you always have to start the process, start the debugger, attach it, and, and so on. And this is quite time consuming um, to be true. And, and if you actually look what how you develop uh, an exploit, and we are talking here about basic buffer overflows, it's, it's pretty standard. And basically what you do, once you have the crash, so we are not talking about the fuzzing part here, it's just when you already know that you can control EIP and then develop the exploit, you need to find the EIP overwrite location, so find the offset on your buffer, and then you will examine the memory layout for, for all the offsets, for the space, the registers, what can you play with it, and, and so on. Then you need to find a way to jump to your shell code, typically like jump ESP and so on, but you can use jump other registers or call uh, any of the registers or just push the register value and then return to it. And then you need to find an address in, in the memory, which actually contains this small assembly instruction that you can use on your, on your exploit. And then you need to generate the shell code in Metasploit, typically, and then put it all together, and uh, if all goes well, you, you manage to develop an exploit. But again, this, this can be a lot of time, uh, even for simple buffer overflows. So I thought that my task or I came up with this idea that why not automate the entire process? There are tools like Mona that already does a great job for you for many of the parts. 
um, but doesn't automate the, the entire flow. And again, this is for most of the cases. Of course, there are corner cases, and there will be always corner cases. For typical buffer overflow, it's just, again, a standard process. So the idea was to develop some tool which can create a working exploit from a crash, like a proof of concept, uh, if possible with zero manual uh, interaction. So I wrote a module in Python, uh, which uses the PYKID library to interact with WinDebug. Uh, this limits this entire tool currently to, to Windows applications. Uh, PYKD is a very powerful Python library that can interact with WinDebug. It's developed by a Russian team. I, they don't really have a name of the group. It's a few developers. You can just Google it and, and you will find all the people participating in that project. And basically it allows you to even start in debug from Python, attach the process, or, or just start the entire process in Python without really opening WinDebug. And it can send and use all of the WinDebug commands uh, from Python, and you can get those output and you can use them, or it has a very rich API, which allows you to read register values, read pointers, search the memory, and so on. So again, this is really powerful, and actually the tool is already released on, on GitHub, and we will put the, the link at the end of the presentation. So what can it do? Uh, again, it, at this point it only works for basic buffer overflows. It can bypass ASLR if the application has a module or DLL which doesn't have the ASLR bit set. So it, it uses one of the methods to, to bypass it. And you can set it on the, on the command line if you want to look for that or, or not. It works for network and Firebase exploits. It's important because the workflow it's a bit different, so if your exploit is file-based, like an MP3 list, then you need to actually generate the file and then open the application and open the file, while with network-based exploits, you actually need to start the application and then send the exploit uh, after. And it will create a successful exploit uh, from the simple crash, and it automates the entire process unless you need to interact with the application for some reason, but if not, then, then basically you don't have to touch it. And you don't need to start WinDebug or anything because the, the script will, will start the process inside WinDebug uh, already. So what's the logic of the application? How does it work? If you find the EIP overwrite location, the offset for that, uh, it uses the pretty much same method that most people usually do. It will create a pattern and then find the, the offset for that pattern. Uh, then it will find registers pointing to your buffer. Uh, then it will find all the bad characters. Uh, that is not cool from the exploit point of view. It will basically go where all the 256 uh, options then it will find a way to jump to your shell code may using maybe a jump instruction or a call instruction or, or something else. It will generate a shell code. Now for this one, it will use Metasploit to generate the shell code. I didn't want it to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, at this point, the, the script is hard-coded to generate a shell code to start calc.exe, but it's basically you just replace one line in the script what kind of shell code you want to, to generate. Basically, you, you have to enter the, the Metasploit command itself. And it, it will read back the shell code, put it all together, and run the exploit. And it will also save the exploit if you want. In case it's a file-based, then it's already saved. Uh, if it's a network-based, you basically you need to do some writing. But it will essentially uh, create a Python script for you, which will save the uh, or which we, we run the, the exploit. So I have a demo here, and hopefully all goes well. So
So, let me delete this file. Okay, so the first example is Minishare. Um, I think if you started with exploit development, you probably came across uh, Security Tube, and they are using Minishare there as well as an example. It's pretty old, but I think it's great for, for education. So basically, I just uh, start the script here, and I will let it run and then go back for the logs. It will log all the important parts uh, of the exploit development. As you can see, it's always starting Minishare and restarting it for all the various steps. At this point, it's looking for bad characters. Well, I will scroll back in a minute. Uh, now it's generating shellcode. It takes a few seconds, and at the end, we will see a cog popping up. Oh, that's great. This is the first time I got cog popping up at the front and not somewhere in the background. So let's see what happened here. So is it seen good enough, or you want me to zoom in even more, maybe a bit more? So it will send in a pattern uh, for Minishare, then it will uh, identify what is the pattern that overwrote EIP. It will identify the offset. Uh, there are some exceptions around, because maybe some of the registers are uninitialized or pointing to, to an uninitialized memory space. And they will throw an exception, but it just ignores that. that. Uh, then it will calculate the, the space you have on the buffer, and then it will start looking for the bad characters, identifying all of them. It will take a list of them, and this will be used when generating the shellcode with Metasploit. Uh, now, it already knows which registers is pointing to your buffer, so it will try, and in case this is ESP, and it will try to find jump ESP, uh, in the loaded modules, so it will go uh, through all the loaded modules and search through them, and it will log how many assemb assembly instructions it found in that module that you can use. Uh, at the end, it will list all of them, uh, all the memory addresses. It will pick up the first one, or actually it will pick up any of those that doesn't contain a bad character, so this list will be filtered. It will generate the share code, but this is uh, Metasploit at the end, and uh, it will run the, the exploit. And then we have the calc in this case. But what it also did, it created a Python script, which is basically the, the actual exploit, and not much is seen here. Yeah, some, the message is there, but... Uh, this Python editor doesn't display it very well. Uh, anyhow, if I start Minishare, and I have this Minishare exploit Python script, which was generated by this. I start it, and then you have a cog in the background. Um, so, so it works. And I can show another demo with, with another one. The EZRM, that's a MP3 player. Basically, it will do uh, the same here. This is, this is a file-based exploit, so it has to create an M3U file uh, in order to crash the application. Now, luckily, the application has a command line option to load the M3U file so I don't need to interact with it, but if it didn't have, I probably need to go every time to the application, load the file, and crash it, and once the crash happened, the script will take over again. So basically, you only need to load the application, then we have Calc again, and if I open the application and load the file,
this list M3U is generated. Hmm. Okay, uh, I will skip that, but basically that file was used to actually create the exploit. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't do it properly manually. Uh, anyhow, let me switch back to the presentation. So I have video here just in case it didn't work, but it worked, so uh, no need to show that. How to use it? Now, there is some pre-work that has to happen uh, because we need to dynamically build the exploit, so I actually need to dynamically build the buffer sent to the application, and for that I need to interact with it. And I just choose making the exploit as a, as a class, and basically you have to populate that class with some initial info. Uh, and basically that's mainly the, the exploit function, but let me go to my text editor and show it here. Oh. Let me choose this one. So basically in the exploit function you define the actual crash, the POC, and then you have this buffer variable which will be a list of strings and you need to do a join uh, on the strings what will be sent into what. Other than that, if you have a POC Python code, you basically copy it uh, to this part. Uh, there are some other things that you need to specify if it's a file based or not. You need to specify the command uh, for the actual application. Uh, if it's a file based exploit, it's best to define the file name as well because you will need to save a file. And there is a save option as well, which basically writing out the function you have here to a file, and, and that's all. That's it. Uh, and if it's, if it's a file based, then the saving is just a pass because the file is, should be already saved and there. So as for the future, of this application, so I think this can be easily developed further for SEH-based exploits uh, to add some more logic around more tricky jumps to your share code, or if your buffer is, is more tricky, um, also possible, it's also possible to develop a DEP bypass with developing prop chains dynamically. But at this point, it doesn't know them. It's just for, for basic buffer overflow. Um, Thank you. All right, let, let me see if I can transfer the screen. It's, yeah. Okay. Okay, so funny thing is that both Chaba and I attended the very same magnificent exploitation training provided by, by Cordelan. But we took very opposite angles of, uh, of looking at what's possible with, uh, with the very same set of tools. So can, it be used very, uh, can we use the very same technology uh, for blue teaming or kind of doing reverse engineering? Typically, when it comes to browser exploits, um, reversing them is time consuming. Um, you have a bunch of challenges. Um, any reverse engineers out in the room? OK, a few hands. So you wouldn't want to waste your time on, uh, on code that is not actually malicious, right? So first, the whole thing comes up with um, an automated sandbox flagging on uh, suspicious behavior or the level two team. Uh, notices something uh, funny, and then it, uh, the thing lands on your desk. So what the next steps are, you typically 
end up looking at an obfuscated source code, um, uh, typically a, a JavaScript code uh, with heavy obfuscation that eventually exploits some uh, browser vulnerability. Let's just assume it's uh, a use after free situation. And then uses a, a bit of a shell code to, um, um, to put it into a heap location and then uh, run it. So there are a number of challenges associated with this. Like if you're analyzing this inside the, the native debugger, um, the browser's built-in debugger, I mean, you first have to spend a bit of time of figuring out where to put the breakpoints if uh, it's possible to put the breakpoints in the locations that, that you need to at all. Then um, you can actually rip the code out of the HTML page and have it analyzed in the external JavaScript engine. But then again, you are not, not having any references any longer to the DOM objects. So if, for any, if in any chance the JavaScript still refers back to certain DOM objects, it will no, no longer work. Also, a bunch of uh, JavaScript code that we've seen in the, in the wild um, implement some sort of anti-debugging or anti-reversing techniques. So trying to detect whether it's being debugged and either not working or working differently. So the methodology really is to deobfuscate, catch the, the function before they execute, set up the breakpoint or even the, um, the overloading of the functions if, if that's your way to do it, and then locate the exploit code and, and understand the, uh, the shell code that uh, happens to be behind it. Now, a word of warning, we're not going to release uh, something that will address all your problems that it would ever come up with the uh, reverse engineering um, browser exploits, but we're trying to let loose something of an idea on how you may want to uh, do it differently than most people uh, are doing. So JavaScript obfuscator, obfuscators use several techniques to, to achieve their goal. They use variable name mangling, they do character substitutes, um, function expressions like arrow functions, lambdas, uh, ifies. Most often, they literally go back to evals. Word of note is that, gladly, since uh, JavaScript is, is not really a, um, a class-based language, we don't have to deal with reflections because that would add enormous complexity to it. Now, the first part is deobfuscating. Now, there's a bunch of deobfuscators out there, like dozens literally, uh, that pretty much do their work. And we don't really want to kind of reinvent the wheel, but we, we want to look at a kind of a different case that does reinventing the wheel in a, in a very different manner. We want to make it sure that the, uh, the JavaScript code is impossible, so make it impossible for the JavaScript code to realize it is being debugged. We want to have a, the malware run its in normal native natural environment, the browser itself, and if possible, stop at the exploit uh, with the least amount of uh, interaction. So we've seen a number of uh, cases when uh, people were trying to tell us that uh, use whatever tools available to rip out the code from the HTML page and drop it into an external engine, that very often fails. So you know, breaking out the, uh, of the jail uh, has failed way too many times for me. So I thought, why not try to break into it? Now, a lot of people shy away from, from WinDebug because you know, it doesn't have a uh, very nice user interface like much of the um, immunity debugger or, or all the debug has. But it comes at the advantage of um, WinDebug that it's awesomely easy to, to script it, especially if you're using the Python uh, extensions for it, so PyKD. Um, we are releasing the code after the conference, but my point is not really so much in releasing the tool, but rather releasing the methodology. So we're releasing a tutorial on uh, how to go about this and how to figure it out on yourself. 
um, worthy of note that browser implementations different, differ significantly. i8 versus i10 versus i11 versus Edge versus Chrome, they all have very different implementations of the, of the JavaScript engine, literally each of them. So for our tools to, to work, you actually have to figure out for each of them um, how you can do the debugging. So the current tool that we are releasing is um, set for i11 and i8. Um, it's deobfuscating the eval-based code um, and it's logging each session to a separate file. And as much as possible, it's um, automating the entire process. So I'm not, much, not sure how many of you have tried to uh, debug browsers from, uh, from WinDebug. Um, one of the challenges is to attach the browser to the debugger. Um, I mean, attach the debugger to the browser, sorry. Typically, browser processes have a lot of uh, separate threads, separate processes, and you have to figure out which one to attach to. If you want to attach, open the WinDebug uh, session and try to run the browser out of it, it will just uh, not work the way you, you intend it to. So first you have to uh, spawn the browser and then figure out uh, the process um, that is related to the specific tab that you want to debug and then uh, attach to that process. So we are automating that using some bit of PowerShell scripting. And um, the big challenge is trying to find the right function to, um, uh, to look into. So luckily, all the browsers, all the major browsers, um, make their symbolic uh, debugging information available. So that uh, is valid for all the different IE versions and also for Chrome. Um, just a word of caution, if you're trying to do Chrome uh, debugging, the debug symbols for Chrome for each version are like around 1.2 gigabytes. So WinDebug has the uh, nasty tendency to actually load all those uh, debug information into memory. So if you're running this in from a virtual machine, you better allocate a lot of memory for the VM. Otherwise, you're, it's gonna, gonna crash the, the VM. Well, not the VM, but uh, basically crash the debug session. So the point is to try to find the right function and uh, we're uh, typically looking at evaluations. So evaluations uh, will be resolved by looking at the uh, symbolic expressions, the um, symbolic function names. And um, I'm not going to go all the way through how it works because we're releasing the tutorial, as I said. But the point is that once you figure out which function uh, implements the evaluation, you will quickly find that the most logical one doesn't really receive immediately the string argument for an eval as an argument. So you have to dig in a, a typically deeper because um, most engines, practically all of the engines I've seen, actually do a pre-compilation of the uh, eval statement. So if they have to run it again and again, they don't need to reparse it. So typically there, is, there will be some sort of a cache, and th those cache functions uh, will play a, a key role in um, getting uh, your task done. So that, uh, those key functions will receive the argument uh, that you're after. Now, after you found the, uh, the function entry point and you set up the breakpoint, um, you, uh, you have to understand how the um, arguments are being passed to it. And unfortunately for Internet Explorer, Although you have the debug symbols, you don't have the private symbols, only the public symbols. So the, uh, the function arguments are not so uh, simple to figure out. So while Mona does a fantastic job, and I can only applaud the, the creator um, for, for making Mona uh, and releasing it, I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out how to figure out a way for a memory address that I was able to find to get a complete chain starting from either register that I have or a, um, an element on, on the stack to put together a chain of pointers. So for that, uh, I'm releasing a tool called uh, chain.py that uh, works exactly that um, um, task, starting from um, either a register, like um, ESP there, but it could be the ECX register. Typically, it's, it's either one of those, so either you're starting from the stack or, or starting from the this pointer that the ECX is typically pointing to. And you specify the number of uh, D words you want to you know, scan 
the, the range of D words, and the minus L uh, is the, the reference count, so how, how deep you want to um, um, check for, for a pointer that is actually pointing to the, to the target address specified in the minus, minus A argument. Now, once, once uh, you figure that out, um, you may find multiple addresses just coincidentally point to the same point, so it will take a bit of trial and error to figure out definitely the one, and for this reason, we're going to do a bit of stress testing to figure out that if we found the, the proper um, chain of, of pointers. Okay, so once we have figured that out, we need to automate things. So we come up with a uh, Windybug script file. The Windybug script is going to help us um, deal with a lot of uh, manuality that would uh, otherwise be needed. So set up a unique log file. It would be nice to have uh, each session logged to a separate file, right? There might be a lot of exceptions that occur naturally within the application, and you don't want to break on those. So you, want to, you might want to ignore certain exceptions while catch other ones. And um, I have to be honest, this is where WinDebug is showing its worst um, in terms of user friendliness. So trying to put out the, the 4H is, is something um, taking me literally hours. Now. I'm going to try to do a demo here. Hopefully it will work. Okay, so... Let me see how can I zoom the text. So it is as simple as this. You open a, a log file. You make sure that you don't in, catch all those unneeded exceptions. You want to make sure that whenever, and ultimately your goal is to catch um, exploits, so when the browser is actually crashing, um, you want to make sure that when, when the application is crashing, you close the log file, you set up a, a breakpoint, and you, you start a thing. So, Starting with the most simple example would be this. You only have a simple eval. Now, the reason why I'm using string concatenation there is you don't want to confuse the source code with the argument. So hunting for the egg, um, like my egg equal one, uh, will not part be part of the source code. So the next case is um, a bit more demanding one. Uh, it's just going to do a bit of a iteration uh, with a bit of com complexity and do um, 100 evals. And ultimately, we're going to get as far as try to stress test it with the ultimate uh, eval bomb. So this is a um, recursive eval evaluation, which will end up crashing the browser typically. Um, depending on the, on the browser implementation, sometimes it just uh, ends up in a stack overflow. And um, to come to the point of this whole exercise is we're trying to uh, look at how the actual deobfuscation is happening. So that said, let's see how we, we can um, try to use this. So it's as simple as starting up the browser, opening up a tab, and then opening up the logging. PowerShell thing, which starts NTSD. So this is something I didn't mention. Um, WinDebug has a GUI. Uh, NTSD is the command line current counterpart of it. The very same thing as just command line. So for, for those of you out there who are um, wondering uh, whether you can do nasty things with the debuggers uh, as attackers, yes, you can. Uh, you might want to watch out for, for NTSD. Um, executable slurking in, in your environment because they, they can be mean as well. So once um, it's set up, you just you know, try to navigate, and the logging is already starting to happen in the, in the other. So here you're seeing the little simple evaluations. Now we're going for, uh, for the longer evaluation with 100 iterations. Um, or we're going to do the um, obfuscated thing, so it's already um, logging the deobfuscated string at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to show you later on how you can 
read it easier. And finally, I'm going to show you the eval bomb. Oh. Yeah, I put it in the, in, the, in the background while it was running. So, you know, literally thousands and thousands of it happening. So once we look at the logs that are produced for each of them, we'll see something like this. So here are all those things that uh, happened during the evaluations. Um, if we go down a bit, probably should have done such a long cycle. Here you will see the, um, the simple deobfuscation that, uh, that has happened. Um, so this is already the, um, the deobfuscated string. And OK, so let's move on to a real thing. So I'm going to look at an actual um, exploit. So this is um, using a, an exploit uh, on a use after free, uh, putting together a ROP chain and doing a, a, a DAP evasion. And this is the actual source code for it. Now, I spent quite a bit of time to try to uh, obfuscate it very heavily. So I ended up with, with something like this. This is a multi-stage um, obfuscation using a different number of techniques. Um, so this is completely uh, unreadable for the, uh, for the human eye, obviously. So let's see what happens if we try to do this. Again, I'm going to sorry, to start the browser, start iLog. And let's see what happens. OK. So two things you should, you should notice. Let's just um, open up the log in a more readable format. <coughs> I can even turn on the highlighting. So this is already back to the deobfuscated string, although it's not pretty printed, but I will let, leave this up to you to do the pretty printing. And the more interesting thing is that we are all actually getting a, a crash here, which is, is being caught. So right now we are in the debugger, in a live session, where as you're trying to move through, you can see that you are right before the exploit happening, and in a few moments, uh, we're going to uh, do the virtual protect, push ESP, and this is when it's jumping to the heap already. And probably you can recognize this already, this FL, uh, DPI weight, FSTF, this is already part of the Metasploit code. So you got a deobfuscated code, and you're, you are been offered the, uh, the malware on a, on a tray because it stops right before executing and actually you can uh, directly look at the source code so you don't even have to you know, replay the whole thing because you have the open uh, debug session at your fingertips. OK, so for future plans, um, we want to add a bit more documentation to the different browsers. So as I said, this has to be maintained for, for very different browsers because the code base is very different. The function names are different for obvious reasons. And even the, uh, uh, the module names are different. So in um, i8, it's the JavaScript is uh, hosted in a jscript.dll uh, on the 
IE9 plus, it's called JScript 9. As from Edge, it's called Chakra. Um, in obviously, you all know that in Chrome, it's uh, it's called um, V8, the engine. It's actually in a, a process called in a DLL called Chrome Child. So I'm providing all these uh, debug symbols for for you to for later reference to figure out the uh, the further details for your own needs. Now, for catching Metasploit shellcode, this is something that we wanted to to try to see if we can um, uh, catch them very easily. The most uh, Predominant cases that we see in Metasploit code are not so much uh, the, the shell codes as much as the uh, Shikata um, encoder. So that's uh, the, the probably the, uh, the most successful one, ev evading most um, AV engines. Um, that that's my, might be an explanation for that. So Shikata has a very strong signature. So once um, you set up a breakpoint for the uh, virtual locks and the um, and the virtual protect calls, then you can actually sniff at, at, at the uh, pointers to, uh, to the memory page. Now, the one last thing with the setting up calls for virtual protect and virtual alloc uh, is something that uh, I need to mention. Uh, it has to be done um, very carefully because the browsers naturally do some uh, allocations for obvious reasons. So uh, I'm also giving out some, um, some instructions on how to filter out the legitimate calls versus the non-legitimate ones. It's, it's not really a rocket science. So that being said, the source codes are available at those uh, GitHub sites. And you, here are the contacts for, for both uh, Chuba and myself. So uh, with that, um, I guess we're opening up for questions. Yes. If any. All right. So then thank you very much for, for your patience and attention. Knowing that it's, uh, it's Saturday afternoon, it's a, <laughs> it's a welcome thing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.